Welcome back to another live session. Uh, thank you so much, as always, for being here. Uh, I was off for uh, two weeks uh, <laughs> on vacation. It was um, a poorly planned vacation in the sense that I uh, typically don't take two Tuesdays off, but I uh, it was just planned ahead of time and, and wasn't thinking about it. So I was off for a couple of weeks. Um, I think that the schedule should be pretty straightforward for the rest of the year. I'm going to go live well into December. I don't anticipate missing um, any additional weeks for the rest of this year. And I think that will get me up to maybe over 140 live sessions. Uh, so starting to hit some crazy numbers of going live. And obviously this is uh, definitely a part of my week that I look forward to. I love engaging with the audience and We've talked quite a bit about this, uh, that 2023 has been a really, really sleepy hiring year. And by the way, um, some of the trends are just continuing to show that it's just there's not a ton of ramp at the end of the year for hiring, uh, something that I expected to see and is very, very typical for this time of year because a lot of hiring managers uh, company years are fiscal and calendar year are the same, not all companies, but a lot of companies. And so a lot of times hiring managers will be told, use it or lose it. So they're really trying to hire people in the last quarter of the year. This is something that people believe that hiring isn't typically that crazy in the fourth quarter, but in a lot of cases, especially October and November can be insanely crazy uh, for hiring. Um, I'm not seeing as much of that. Uh, we did get some whispers of the Google freeze um, coming through, especially for GCP and, and Google hiring seems to be really slow and just overall hiring um, does feel a little bit slower. I think we're seeing a lot of those recessionary trends, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm getting long-winded here. As you're coming into the session, uh, any and all questions are welcome. Obviously, I love that positive pitch and tone with questions. I'm not always going to be positive about everything, but I'll try and keep everything on a positive tone. Let me know where you're visiting from. Um, and again, any questions, comments, everything's on the table. Anything you want to bring into the session today that you think would be valuable for the community is great. I'm going to just take a moment to reference the video I did yesterday. So it says program manager, but it's a very common question. I handled, tell me about a time when a program or project was behind schedule and the step or steps you took to get things back on track. The likelihood that in an interview, you're going to be asked this in multiple positions about a project, initiative, program, getting behind schedule, and the steps you took to get those things back on track is relatively high. So just a good example to listen through. Remember, when we're thinking about any behavioral example, we're trying to think about those initial conversations, that initial data and research. Then we're talking about testing and execution, then launching, presenting, documenting. And that's more on the problem solving side. Again, with the interpersonal stuff, we're not going to do as much testing and execution, of course. Um, OK, what else do we want to chat about? Um, well. Today in our downtimes, because again, it's been very sleepy this year, we'll talk a little bit more about why searching for a job sucks and how to get around that and feel a little bit better about your job search if you're in that mode or considering hopping into that mode. If this is your first time here, my name is Jeff H. Seip. My business is practiceinterviews.com. I do one-on-one -on -one interview, one-on-one -on -one negotiation coaching, and I have an interview mastery course that's gotten a ton of great feedback over the last a year and a half since I launched it. My AI practice interview tool, which is going to allow you to interact and get very specific feedback. Uh, the initial version is coming out in the next couple of weeks. Paid version will not be till January. So you're just going to hear me uh, talking about it quite a bit. But this is the future so that it's less money to spend to get great coaching and great feedback. And that can all be driven through AI. And we could talk about AI today if you want. Um, if you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, I do go live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And I do new original content videos every single Monday, back to every Monday. And I'm going to do more shorts coming up. I keep saying I'm doing that, but uh, the plan is to release shorts on Wednesdays. Whew. Okay. We're five minutes in. Let's dive in. Remember, any and all questions are welcome. And thank you again for being here. 
Hi, Jeff. I've successfully completed all my rounds for the TAM role in Toronto, including the GCA leadership, Googliness, and RRK2. Okay. Um, okay, let's jump up to the second one. The feedback I've received across the board has been really good. However, my recruiter recently informed me that there's a temporary halt on hiring. Yeah, this is GCP. She expressed a great deal of optimism about my application. While I'm optimistic, I'm not sure how confident I should be given the circumstances, thoughts. So as always, uh, when Google pauses, so this is a TAM, a technical account manager role. This is for Google Cloud Platform, and this is a lot of just account management, right? So um, GCP across the board has kind of paused moving forward with positions, and they always say it's going to be a week or two, but it's always longer. GCP is a pretty big revenue generator. So yeah, I would agree with your recruiter long term. I'm not that worried about it. TAMs are, there's a lot of TAM roles needed and necessary at the organization. So I think TAM roles are uh, really protected and you should be absolutely fine. It's just, it's hard to know when these things are going to open up. I, I still think it's going to be this year. Um, I think they're going to want to progress and move forward with candidates this year, but it's just a little bit of sitting tight. The internal decisions that Google take an incredibly long amount of time. They're a huge organization. I think sometimes, you know, I would be critical just to say that I, I believe these decisions could be made a little bit faster, but um, I'm not running like a trillion dollar company. So um it, it just, it can be a little bit slow, but I would remain super, super positive and then just create that cadence with your recruiter. And how do we create that cadence? We just ask, Hey, uh, let's say our recruiter, Sue, Hey Sue, is it okay if I just check in once a week? I just kind of feel like that would be really helpful for me. Is it okay if I check in once every two weeks, et cetera, create that relationship with your recruiter where you're asking how often you can check in. Uh, it can be really, really valuable for building a strong relationship. Hey, how's it going? Uh, hi from SF. In addition to the slow hiring, the Bay Area has been the most humid I've felt in years. What gives these October weather trends? Um, don't get me started on weather. I grew up in Boston. It was all we talked about my entire life. And so I've tried to bring that to San Diego. Um, not everybody responds well because San Diego has... I guess San Diego is like the biggest microclimate in the U.S., so uh, we don't get a lot of changes in weather, but I'm, I'm hoping we have another wet winter in California. We just could use some more rain, of course. Uh, cleared Google on-site TPM interview November 2022. Never had a team match. Several changes on recruiters. Third one said they closed the application in May, and fourth one said... That if I I should that said that I reapply. Okay, is this common? Um, yeah, let's talk about that. And let's just go to the second part. What do you what to do if your application is closed after eight months of waiting for a team match? Reasons? Can they move me to another role? Um, so technically, technically, uh, typically, um, a company like a Google will allow your feedback to stay viable for one year. Um, meaning that if you were able to get in front of TPM interviews uh, by the end of November um, or get a team match that you might not have to re-interview. But if they closed out your application, uh, it just means reapplying to like or similar roles. You're going to have to re-interview. That's the strong, strong likelihood. It's always possible that they repurpose your GCA or GNL, uh, Googliness and Leadership interviews, just because those are pretty, um, they're a little bit more generic. Of course, the GCA interview is going to be catered by role, uh, but you may have to re-interview. And not getting team matched is actually quite a bit more common than I think people realize. And, and part of that probably was just November, you just hit in a time where hiring was really down. Um, and sometimes it's just overall alignment and it's just really hard to um, see behind the curtain because uh, we just don't know. But yeah, unfortunately, there, there's probably a um, pretty high likelihood that you're going to have to re-interview. And I'm sorry that you're going to have to do that because it's tough to get through. But here's the good news. Because you've already passed the gauntlet before and got to that team match stage, 
Absolutely. They're going to revisit you. I mean, they would just be foolish not to because you've already shown that you can not only that you have a good background, but that you can perform in these interviews. Uh, sorry to hear about that. And okay, just this was an SF TPM role. Okay, so um, Bay Area TPM. One other good piece of information is uh, just that I've been sharing is TPM roles pay better than they've ever paid, uh, especially at Google. So um, what I saw even two or three years ago, uh, these salaries have gone up quite a bit. Obviously, you got to find the right team, pass the interviews again, um, but that's some good news. If you have additional questions, let me know. Hey, Jeff, haven't seen many remote Google SWE openings here in Brazil this year. Uh, do you think Google will keep hiring for remote positions or does this signal a new trend of only hybrid? This is a great question. Uh, I think that we are going to see more of a push to hybrid. Um, the U.S. in particular, and, and I know you're in Brazil, but the U.S. in particular has remained pretty remote friendly where a lot of other countries have really pushed to be back in the office full time. Google's really pushing for a hybrid approach. Um, obviously, the biggest office in Brazil is Sao Paulo. Um, you have to, you know, that has to make sense for you to want to potentially relocate there. Um, obviously, it's a huge city. And so maybe that's that's not something that you desire. But yeah, I think remote's going to get tougher. Um, and especially with less hiring across the board, they're probably going to drive towards people who are willing to go into the office. Now, do I agree with that personally? No, I don't. I think some people perform better in the office. Some people perform better working from home. And I don't think that there's one it meets all, right? Like it works for everybody, even though we've seen some of these CEOs clearly saying, hey, like being in the office is better. I just don't agree with that. Everybody's different. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see a lot less fully remote roles, unfortunately. Hey, Jeff, you have a question? That's what I'm here for. There's a position in Google Play brand marketing. I've worked in Google Play department as a temp, but no marketing experience. Do you think I have some chances? So if you've worked in the Google Play department um, as a contractor, as a TVC, uh, this is your opportunity to network. So go and try and reconnect with some of those people that you worked with on LinkedIn and ask them questions or anybody's email that you have, et cetera. I would talk to them about it. I do think that if you're going after a marketing position, you're going to have serious competition to try and beat out those people who do have marketing experience. Uh, but you know the environment, you've been there, you've worked within that part of the organization. This is really in line with a question that came through on my Slack community today. Somebody was trying to go after something similar, like they had experience in the space, but not in that exact role. It also depends on the level of the role. If the marketing role is like an L3, then there's more potential than if it was a higher level role. Uh, but definitely network with those people you know use your time there as an advantage to have a leg up on those who have never worked within the organization. I hope that helps. Hi, Jeff. Hello from London, UK. Just got an oral offer from G L5 TSA technical solutions architect. We're going to have to come back to that. Maybe you can tell me the base of 130, 15% target bonus for your GSU is 230K USD and an 18K sign up. Oh, this is all in USD. Okay. Just like to check if that's a fair offer or how far I can push it. Thanks a lot for all your videos. I wouldn't be able to land the offer without your guidance. Daniel, thank you so much for the positive feedback. Obviously, I'm just a very small part of the journey. You put in all the work. Um, let's go back to TSA. Um, and this is just a good note for everybody, always. Uh, abbreviations just in the moment, like sometimes I don't connect with them. And sometimes when you're interviewing and you use what seems to be a very, um, common abbreviation like sometimes people just list, miss it in the moment i really struggle with abbreviations personally so come back for tsa i mean you just got this initial offer from google so 
if it's the initial offer and you haven't negotiated at all, um, I mean, for London, this actually looks pretty decent, but absolutely on the equity, I would be really, really pushing on that equity. I would counter on the equity, you know, at least in the high threes, maybe into the fours, um, really, really push on that equity. See if you can bring the base up. Usually the base ranges are pretty tight, right? You're only going to maybe move at five or 10 K. Um, you can definitely try and push on that sign on. So here's the question more on the specific title. Give me that full title and let me know if you've actually negotiated, given any anchor, or any numbers before they presented this offer. Let's talk about for you and for the audience. The useful data point. My sourcer confirms an extension of feedback period to 18 months, but that we can also refresh it anytime after 12 months, whichever is best. First priority is team match. Okay, so let's talk about this. I would, I haven't heard this as a company wide policy. So I'll, I'll try and confirm that. Um, I have seen much more of a case by case basis. If they close out your application, uh, there's just no guarantees that that feedback will hold. And we just need to think about feedback from a role related knowledge perspective. Uh, the likelihood that you might end up in a different type of role and have to redo some of the role related knowledge, it's just relatively high. So I haven't seen this as a blanket across the board statement. Hey, if it is, that's fantastic news. I'm going to go and try and validate that and I'll come back next week and, and let you know what I found out. Um, definitely show up, come back next week and and we can talk a little bit more about it. I haven't seen that again as a blanket overall, but um, that's a great data point for the audience. And because of the freeze and the layoffs and all the hiccups, you'd hope that some of the feedback could be extended for longer periods of time, especially the generic stuff, right? especially the googliness and leadership interview like that's pretty standard across the board so that should absolutely just be able to be repurposed similar situation here you've passed hc a couple weeks ago and they're halting temporarily until future 24 budget review the recruiter is hoping have some more clarity this week yeah so this is a little a little confusing to me so let's talk about it just historically, what I've seen is that this budget alignment stuff doesn't even happen until like Q2 of the following year, which would be obviously 2024. I just haven't seen um, getting all those budgets organized and arranged uh, in the previous year, which obviously was something that you would think would be done, but it just seems to be a little bit more fluid than that. Hey, if we're hearing back this week, that's fantastic news. I hope that's the case. And let's yeah, let's all collectively hope for that and put out the good vibes for that. But um, I've heard this from multiple people that they're looking for the budget review. And it's like, well, what happened to the 2023 budget? Like, why is this happening now? It's just it's a, it's just a little confusing. Um, so I'm just hoping that they will push forward. Uh, but I don't think that they're going to have their entire budget for 2024 figured out in the next week. I just I never historically the data hasn't shown that historically, but let's, let's hope for the best and keep us posted. Really appreciate your interview question videos. These are really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Yeah. And like, let's come back. Um, what are we, how are we feeling about those? Um, yeah, I mean, are people liking those? I've been driving more towards the questions and answers videos. Like they're doing okay. And everything's really slow this year, but as the audience that's here on this live, do you like those question and answer videos? You can see I'm trying to teach a very, very specific format. This is the format that I'm going to use with my AI tool, which is creating a very systemized process for how uh, candidates answer interview questions. There's no ambiguity. There's an exact process in line. So yeah, just be curious to know what people are thinking about those videos. Some are doing okay. Some aren't doing that great. Hi from Virginia and can really relate to your live theme today. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get a little bit into that. Okay, so we are confirming, yes, TSA is a technical solutions con architect. Okay, because this is interesting because um, a lot of times architects will fall within GCP. So a 15% target bonus would be 
weird because uh, architects on the GCP side actually have a sales incentive. And so I wasn't 100% sure. Um, and then let's see if, if we can get, if you came back and let us, I will also want to know, uh, Daniel, um, this offer that was presented to you was this, have you anchored, provided a range, provided a number, or was this just the first number or numbers that they gave to you? It's a really critical data point for us to understand how much you can push back on what they've given you. Not that I wouldn't want you to push back in general, but okay. So brand marketing question. I've already discussed with my former manager from Google, but he thinks that it'll be a better to look for a different position, but I have other colleagues to refer me. Yeah. So we want to take guidance and advice from people, right? And we don't want people to tell us what's possible and what's not possible. If we believe it's possible, we should get after anything that we personally believe in in life. And yeah, I, I sidebar quite a bit in these live sessions, but self-belief is going to be the most important thing for you. So um, having relevant experience to the core function of the role is important. So if the core function of the role is marketing and you don't have marketing experience, that can be challenging. Right. And so that's probably the lens and the way they're seeing it. Now, is there anything you can do to up your marketing skills? Maybe they have it designated as an L4, but because of your experience in the Google Play space, they'd be willing to consider an L3, all sorts of considerations. But yeah, if the core function of the role is marketing and you don't have any marketing experience, it definitely will be more challenging. But I just, I never want to tell anybody what's possible and what's not possible because um, I don't want to limit anybody's ability to get after anything. Uh, speaking in real terms is important, but again, I don't want to limit or hold anybody back. And would referring be really helpful? Referrals are always your best path. So always take a referral, always. Hey, Jeff, I was interviewing for a sales analyst position. And after interviewing with the hiring manager, I was told I did really well, but I was overqualified for the position. Okay. And they didn't have a budget for a senior role. In your experience, is this believable feedback? Okay. So um, I don't see any reason to give you this feedback if it's not the truth. I mean, it's just, it would be just such a waste of time, in my opinion. Like, I'm just going to give it to you straight. And if I don't want to tell you, I'm just not going to tell you. I'm going to say, hey, look, unfortunately, I can't provide specific feedback. We've decided to move forward with others. I wouldn't tell you that unless it was the truth. And okay, so you're overqualified for that role. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really nothing you can do about that. Um, it can be more about just identifying alignment up front to make sure that your experience aligns with the needs of the role, responsibilities of the role, et cetera. That's not always possible, right? And in my opinion, oftentimes, even if we appear to be a little bit overqualified or a little bit underqualified, I always want people to get after it because oftentimes companies can level up, they can up the comp for the right person. I don't like to close doors on the front end. Let's play out the scenario and see what happens. Now, I know there's a lot of work that goes into preparing for interviews and doing your research, et cetera. So not everybody loves that approach, but you'd be shocked at how many companies will flex um, up if you're a little overqualified, like in your example, or a little underqualified, but you're a good match. So um, I'm always thinking get after it, but I don't think that they would give you that feedback just to make something up or you at least hope not that just it just doesn't really make a lot of sense i'm not saying it doesn't happen i'm sure it does but it just seems a little silly i hope that helps hey jeff hubs hubs um hubs passed on site thanks to your help for a l6 gcp engineering manager role and has been team matching for two weeks em role um engagement manager oh uh oh em engineering manager role was filled internally recruiter said another em role was converted 
to an L6 lead IC roll in GCP on Friday. Is that viewed as a down level of sorts? Should he hold out for an EM spot in this market? He's not really sure what a team lead entails. Okay, so let's. So I think Hubs is husband. Um, and so, so there is a big difference between an engineering manager and a lead. A lead is going to lead more junior engineers, um, but they're, they're indirect reports. They're not direct reports. Um, an eng manager is, I don't know, I think it's a better role um, and better path. It really depends on what your husband wants. Um, I would be cautious about dropping from an eng manager to an eng lead role, but everybody's circumstance is different. Uh, if your husband really needs a position, is unemployed, it's something to consider, can get in the door to Google to change ultimately over time from a lead to a manager, all these items are worth considering. But if they went in as an eng manager, I would ideally hope that they could stay there but there's just so many other factors that i i don't have an awareness around that i don't i don't want to drive too much of that without knowing the full picture if you want to share more i'm, I'm happy to dive in a little bit deeper hi jeff i'm going back to school for a doctorate in business administration finance i'm currently in the northwest where competition is high my friends have expressed concerns that maybe becoming over, maybe become overqualified than the hiring managers, thus limiting opportunities. Okay. Do you foresee overqualifications being an issue if I go for director and VP level roles upon graduation? Okay. Lots of data that I would, I would want to know. Um, typically coming out of school, if you're, if you're going from education and just getting more education, you're likely not going to go into a company at a director or VP role unless it's a very small startup. You'd probably start at a lower level role just because those level roles are probably going to require some experience dealing with large scope, scale, et cetera. But I, I don't have enough data, so maybe you can come back and tell me. Um, you being overqualified, I, I don't really worry about that. Um, I do have some opinions on higher education um, and the value of higher education. Now, I think when we talk about a doctorate, uh, that's a little bit different. I think a doctorate still carries the same level of value and not everybody's going to like it, but I think masters don't carry as much value as they did five years ago, 10 years ago, definitely not as much as they did 20 years ago, where you'd actually get a pay increase just by getting a master's, you just get $10,000 more, which nowadays isn't that much, but back then it, it was quite a bit. Um, but I just think the way we're looking at education and the cost of education and the, and the return on investment is getting to be less and less over time. And then we don't know what education is going to look like in five years with AI. So those are other considerations. But if you want to give me a little bit more context, I'm I'm happy to dive in deeper if it helps. Hi, Jeff. I finished an interview loop for a strategy lead position at GTEC, waiting for the final decision as my recruiter told me some members of the panel were out of office. Ugh. Okay. Um, what did the recruiter mean by panel? It's been three weeks since my final round. Is that HC? Also, is the hiring freeze across all of G or GCP? Yes. Yeah, so um, panel is just how they refer to the people who interviewed you. Your interview panel, even though obviously we know like interviews are typically done one to one um, at Google. So I just I absolutely um just can't stand when they say people were out of the office so they can't make a decision it's an excuse and it's a it's a poor one um, after three weeks all the interview feedback should be in and they should give you a more clear indication look we like you we we just want to talk to others or they're still waiting on interview feedback which again is not acceptable but may be the case um I've heard like roles are definitely still moving forward. GCP seems to be the freeze area, but I've heard of other pauses. It's just been a little bit sporadic. Sometimes the information I 
get coming out of Google is, is a little unclear. Um, but at three weeks now, I think you can push your recruiter to say, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you staying in touch with me. I'm just looking for a little bit more clarity on what's going on. Are we still waiting on interview feedback? Am I one of a few candidates that's being considered? Can you provide a little bit more clarity for me, please? Because this generic communication just makes it much tougher for you to figure out what the heck is going on. I hope that helps. Okay, we're at the 30s. I'm just going to take two seconds to hit up on my services. My name is Jeff H. Sype. My business is practiceinterviews.com. I do one-on-one -on -one interview and one-on-one -on -one negotiation coaching. I have an interview mastery course and my AI practice interview tool. Um, some in initial versions and MVP is coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'll be really limited. And then we'll have that paid version out in January. So just stay tuned. I'll continue to talk about it quite a bit. Um, if you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, I go live. 10 a.m. Pacific time every Tuesday and new original content every Monday. And by the way, practiceinterviews.com. I got a ton of free resources on there. Check it out. Um, I have a lot of blog articles, just a lot of good free content on there if you like it or if you want it. Uh, for the L5 TSA position, I initially asked for 360 GSUs. This is the first response from G. The role is for GCP, but more internal facing and a focus in on innovation, not a customer facing role. Amazing, Daniel. So here's where we're at. You asked for 360 GSUs initially. Now they came back with 230. This is where you use a meet me in the middle strategy. So when you come back and negotiate the second time around, let's not think about base and sign on this time. Let's just think about equity. So you say to your recruiter, and remember, this is always done via phone. We never, ever negotiate via email. We lose all of our power. What I want you to do is, let's say your recruiter's name is Sue. Obviously, I'm just making this up. You'd say, Sue, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I think we're getting closer. As you know, my initial equity request was 360. We're at 230. If you can meet me in the middle, so we're meeting in the middle 130K. So if I can do some quick math, 65K. So that brings us up to 295K in equity. So you'd say, so if you can just meet me in the middle on equity at 295K, I'd strongly consider the offer. And that's it. And so whatever Sue says, to push back, thank you, I appreciate it. I'd really appreciate if you take my expectations back to the comp team. One of the biggest items, I did a TikTok on this recently. I see all this negotiation advice with people saying, I'd like to have, it'd be nice to have, it'd be great to have. We don't wanna use any fillers in negotiation. We wanna be very clean and clear that these are our expectations. And we want to stay firm on those expectations, but show massive amounts of gratitude along the way. You're holding your ground, but you're being gracious and kind, but we're not using filler words. If you can meet me in the middle at 295K in equity, I would strongly consider the offer. And that's it. Those are your expectations. And then if they push back, these are my expectations. I'd appreciate it if you take it back to the comp team. But again, you're not saying it'd be nice to have, it'd be great to have. This is what you're asking for. I hope that helps. Um, I still think you can drive up this offer on the base of 130. These would be additional negotiations when they stop going on the equity to add a little bit more base, a little bit more sign on. Um, I think the numbers look good right now for London, unfortunately, tech in London. Uh, cost of living. Cost of labor for tech in London is just not great. It's come up a little bit over time. It still needs to come up quite a bit, but on the front end, the offer looks decent, but you got to keep pushing back and good luck. Um, hey, Jeff, I'm a college senior applying to APM roles, but I'm not getting interviews. Are there any tips you have or product adjacent roles you would recommend? So um, again, I, I just always like to just highlight to the community, like I just wanna make sure that I am 100% aligned on the roles that we're talking about here because some, some of the abbreviations are used. So this could be like 
uh, associate product manager, associate program manager, something like that. Um, it's hard to get interviews if you're applying, period. I mean, that's just, it's, it's such a small percentage of people who actually get hired who apply to roles. And when they apply, usually they have such strong alignment that that's why they get through the door. So my recommendation is to network, is to not apply. Now, is that really easy as a college senior? No, no, it's really challenging. But this is where you should really be building up your LinkedIn profile, trying to network with people on LinkedIn and not by asking for a job, but by saying, hey, I came across this really cool product article and how um, how AI is impacting the product space and you just share the article with them or you just share the video with them. That's the giving approach is the best networking approach. I talk about this all the time. Nobody does it. That's okay. But that's the approach I would take. Um, adjacent positions. Tell me a little bit more about like your education and what exactly you're looking for. And I think we can dive in a little deeper. Yes, husband was trying to fit in more characters. Yeah, I know the character thing is weird. Um, okay, cool. Hey, Jeff, went through all the TAM interviews, didn't get an offer. Was told hiring was stopped globally for the role. We'll reach out in the future and interview feedback is valid for 18 months. Okay, so you're hearing 18 months too. Um, is this normal? Got great interview feedback, saw a few folks starting in the role over the last two weeks. Should I consider that I got rejected, but the recruiter didn't want to give me bad news? GCP has really paused on hiring. So if you've seen people starting in those roles over the last couple of weeks, they were probably sign their offer letter four weeks ago or six weeks ago. So that's probably why you're seeing that. They have actually paused TAM roles. Um, but this is kind of weird feedback. Like, I don't know. I would just be looking for a little more clarity. You can follow up with your recruiter and say, I just want to clarify all my interviews were successful. And when TAM roles start hiring again, you're going to be putting me in the team match phase. I have to re-interview. Just a little more clarity. I think that this would be my one of my number one pieces of advice to organizations um, when training recruiters is to teach them how to communicate more clearly uh, because the massive amounts of ambiguity are... And it's just really painful. And we all go through this experience on a weekly basis of recruiters sharing messaging that's not very clear. And so what we need to do is whenever the messaging isn't clear, we need to poke at it in a really friendly and kind way. Um, but it can be really, really challenging. Yeah. Um, I hope that helps. Let me know if you have more questions. The doctorate has... Doctorate has more value if it's technical data, math, or engineering. Agree, higher ed is less valuable. Yeah, so again, I, I mean, I think that that there's value in a doctorate in terms of it, it is a huge differentiator. Like, what is the percent of people who get to the doctorate level in anything? I mean, it's well under 1%, right? So, so that's a little bit more of a differential than like a master's or an MBA. And this is not to knock on anybody who has an MBA. That's it's an incredible accomplishment to complete any level of higher education and schooling. And it, it comes with challenges. And a lot of people today are managing full-time jobs and doing these degrees as well. But as education has become so expensive with current interest rates, looking at the ROI of just really working on your interview skills, your networking skills, the return on investment there can be much higher. I did a recent LinkedIn poll and the poll was basically, if you were going after one of the elite MBAs, especially in the US like MIT or Stanford or any of these, um, they're well over $200,000 USD. So I put a poll out there, would you rather invest in an MBA or an AI? product or tool. And the vast majority were saying AI product or tool. So just think about if you're going to spend that money, how could you spend that money in a different way to get more money back quicker? Because I think we're going to see, we can't even 
we can't even picture what the world is going to look like in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And it, it's going to look so different that thinking about paying back that expensive education now or taking on that expensive education now, it's just going to be really, really interesting to see how that plays out over time. And that's a very long subject that we can happily dive into if the audience wants to. Hey, Jeff, welcome back. Thanks. Happy to be back. Uh, I've recently completed all interview stages for a customer engineer role and the recruiter share that they've received positive feedback. As the next steps, recruiter mentioned that you need to wait for all candidates to finalize their interviews. And once they complete, the hiring manager will make a decision. It's approaching two weeks now with no communication from the recruiter. Should I be concerned what is typically going on behind the scenes? Uh, they're just probably going through the interviews and it's really hard because some hiring managers want to see a lot of people and some just kind of know and can make quicker decisions. And so we can't, uh, we can't control them or control that scenario. Now, if it's been a couple of weeks, my strong recommendation is probably to check in today, tomorrow, or Thursday, not Friday. Um, I would definitely check in at the latest on Thursday, but check in. If it's been a couple of weeks, they should have provided you with an update and it should have been a no update update. You should have already had a couple of updates over the last couple of weeks that just said, hey, just touch and base. We're still waiting on a decision. I'll keep you updated. Um, again, this is something that that I taught in my time at Google, but uh, it's not really happening, unfortunately. The no update update is one of the most valuable things that not only recruiters, but any person can do. So two quick tips. When you know somebody's waiting on something, just don't let them go too long. Just message them and say, hey, Jane, uh, still waiting on a decision. I'll get back to you shortly, right? That little 10 second, five second email will change the way people experience you. Um, that's one. I had another and it already disappeared from my mind. Um, oh, acknowledge. So when somebody sends you something important that you've been waiting on or something or anything, like I have a client tomorrow who wanted to share additional details, uh, job description details with me. So they sent it to me. All I did was I wrote acknowledged just so that they know that I've seen what they shared with me. So these no update updates and just sending an email that with one word that says acknowledged change your life. It will be so amazing the way others experience you. Just my two cents. Tangent as always. How Google will help a new employee to relocate in another country? Um, well, they're gonna, um, how are they gonna help you relocate? Uh, typically, oh, okay, sorry. How will Google help a new employee relocate? So if you're a new employee who's going through relocation, they're going to offer a relocation package. Um, they have a third party relocation um, company that they work with. They're going to offer you basically it's a pick and choose. Um, you get to it, it depends on level and there's some other factors, but usually it's a pick and choose. You decide whether you want temp housing. You want them to help with the closing costs of selling your house to move. You want to take a trip to look at the area, et cetera. Um, but they're helpful. Um, and I always recommend, again, it, it depends on your unique scenario, but I always recommend if you are working with a relocation coordinator, take the reload package, taking the lump sum of money. It, it does make sense for some people, but that lump sum of money is going to be taxed. So it's just something to keep in mind. Hey, Raul, good to hear from you. Uh, I had a good vacation. Um, I was in my former state, uh, I used to live in Hawaii. So um, back in Hawaii, I've been very fortunate to live on both Oahu and Maui in my lifetime. And uh, ultimately the goal maybe to, to live there in the future as well. Uh, I just, I love it. Thanks though. Thanks for being here. Could you share insights regarding the job market in November and December? Is it worthwhile to actively networking network during this period or would it be more advantageous to wait until January or after the holidays? Absolutely get after it now. Um, there's, if you're really considering making a move, there's no reason to delay now. 
And even as we look into December, hiring's happening in December. Is it happening the last two weeks of December? Not really, but there is motivation internally at these companies to continue to hire into December. So there's still a good timeline there. And by the way, you're just setting it up appropriately. There's no reason to ever wait, in my opinion. If you're thinking that you want to make a move, I would start networking now. Um, and I think the other kind of, I don't know, I, when we talk about January, it's, it's not as though, and not that you're saying this, it's not as though January 1st or 2nd or whatever day we're back in the office, all of a sudden, all these jobs open up. It's kind of a slow trickle going into the year. So I definitely recommend get after it now. And even if your preferred position isn't coming up until next year, you're going to be in a better position than those that decided to wait till January. Just my two cents. Hey, Jeff, I received an email from Microsoft that an interview would be scheduled for a product manager role on the 23rd of October. What are the timelines I should be looking for for the interview process? An interview would be scheduled for a product manager. Well, that's confusing. If you just, if you just, I don't know, you received an email because um, that was yesterday. So I hope, uh, I hope they weren't sending you that email today. Um, timelines for the interview process vary greatly. Uh, Microsoft tends to move a little faster and some of the other big tech companies. So, you know, four to six weeks. And of course, now let's kind of talk about the timeline of year. Like they're gonna to wanna to close this out by early December at the absolute latest. So they tend to move pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, my recommendation is to push the process as much as you can, as much as you're prepared and ready to interview. Um, but if everything rolls correctly, um, it should all be completed this year, no problem. Hey, Jeff, uh, thanks. I didn't consider the AI component. I have about eight years of experience with six being in tech at Microsoft. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the doctorate. And I, I'm gonna have you, well, okay, sorry. Let's, let's jump to these next comments so I can learn a little more. Unfortunately, I was a part of the layoffs, although I secured a role my MBS and MS finance seem to hold no weight, but I rebounded and currently a finance manager at CBRE. Okay, cool. Okay, didn't. Okay, so okay, so those are repeated. Okay, so yes, um, the the master's degrees are just they're, they're carrying less weight today. I mean, that's just the reality of the market. That's not my opinion. I I, I think that's pretty much a fact. Um, the question is, is what's the driver or motivation? What's your why? Why are you getting a doctorate? So I want you to come back and answer that question. What's the motivation? Let's dive into that why. Why are you going after a doctorate? And then as a community, we can all chime in and say whether we think it's a good idea or not. And of course, these are just our opinions. You ultimately need to make a decision that, that makes the most sense for you. Yeah, CE role was at Google, by the way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that other companies are really calling it a customer engineer. Um, and so uh, that was my assumption. But th thanks for clarifying. I always appreciate that. I went through four or five rounds of interviews for an investment company. My background check also started, but I got delayed and they gave the offer to someone else. Is it real or they just made an excuse? I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't want to say one way or the other because I literally just have no access to the data and information. And that's where I'm really careful to state an opinion um, when I just don't have all the facts, unfortunately. Um, you know, if, if they started a background check, like it got delayed, Typically, background checks get delayed when they have to go overseas. Um, sometimes it can be take longer to get that data. But um, yeah, I don't. That's that's the only insight I can give. The rest, I would just be guessing. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to hear that. 
Uh, are G recruiters reporting another hiring freeze? Yeah. Um, so Raul GCP is frozen pretty much. I don't, I, again, I, I say all these things, but, but you know, what I've experienced in the, I mean, we're now talking about five years in and almost six years out of Google. I mean, it's crazy, but um, I always experienced that there were outliers and, and sometimes there would be hires um, that, that n never was it super rigid um, in that sense. But GCP has been frozen for a few weeks. I think they've still conducted interviews and taken people through the process, but, but moving through an offer to offer accept, I haven't seen that for maybe like two to three weeks. Um, I, I've heard whispers of it happening in other parts of the organization as well, but GCP is like the most well known right now. Um, and I like I tap into my internal contacts, but quite honestly, like they're the same people who I always tap into. So sometimes they'll get a little annoyed with me when I blow them up. So um, I try to check in on a limited basis and know that um, I'm not reaching out to these people to ask about their families or their kids. They'll just get blown up with eight texts from me about what's going on at Google. And I think they're getting a little worn out of me. So I, I try to space it out a little bit, but I can try and find out more um, and come back next week with a little bit more guidance. In the context of a career change, how do I go about contacting someone employed in a position I'm in, interested in to understand if it's something that I'd like to do? Those conversations, um, and they, it, it's not, Gavin, that you can't reach out to these people and ask. Some people are very willing to help. I think two pieces of advice. If you have a stronger connection to somebody who's employed in a position that you like, like at least you worked with them or in the past, something that's a little warmer, I'd start there. I'd also potentially look at somebody who had a major career transition into that type of role because maybe they'd be more willing to share their own personal experience. But again, if you are asking people who you don't know, that's starting off by asking them for something. So it's it's a it's a taking mindset. This is not to poke at you, but it's just to to realize that if you gave them something first, it might work better. So you could say, you know, it's really interesting that you decided to transition into X role. I saw this cool article about your space that I wanted to share with you. Then maybe a secondary conversation opens up that dialogue. Uh, I hope that helps. You did your ROK1 and two GCA for a TAM role. Wow, we're getting a lot of TAMs in here today. And as per my recruiter, I got a green light and a high recommendation from the interviewers, one of which being the hiring manager. I was just told that TAM roles have been eliminated and are no longer hiring after three week hold freeze. Is this normal? The recruiter said maybe in Q1 next year, more roles might open up. Okay, I don't wanna um, argue and I'm not going to argue with what's coming through. So maybe they have decided to cancel TAM rolls for the rest of this year. Um, super disappointing to hear. Um, I have a couple of TAM clients in the negotiation phase, so this is definitely going to impact them. Um, and it's just a it's just a bummer that this stuff keeps happening. Um, you know, it's it's really sad to hear. I mean, do I think they're going to open up more TAM rolls? 100%. They're not going to back away from GCP. It's their second best revenue generator uh, behind um, behind ads, of course. So um, I think that they will hire in the future. If it's going to get pushed to Q1, uh, it's a bummer. But just stay in touch with your recruiter. Uh, I still see these as very viable positions. And I still think GCP, um, I think it's a good platform that they're not going to they're not going to walk away from, obviously. Sorry to hear that. Hey, Jeff, what is the best way to seek feedback on where my resume profile is falling short with Google product hiring managers? I've been working with a recruiter for well over a year and still struggling. Okay. Oops, sorry. Still struggling on getting traction. I've done the connect with a Googler as well, but not seeing a ton of movement. Any advice? 
Um, well, I mean, I would say, you know, like typically where resumes fall short is, is role alignment. So as you're applying to roles or getting referred to roles, make sure you have a bulleted summary that really aligns with the needs of the role, the requirements of the role, et cetera. A bulleted summary is at the top of our resume. It's five, six bullets tops. None of those bullets go over one line and they're very, very specific skills. And then of course, we can throw our resume and the job description into ChatGPT and say, create a five bullet summary for me that align on specific skills within my background and the role and boom, that summary is created in 12 seconds, right? So um, that's something to consider. I, I can't really tell you without looking at it. Um, if you've been having some ability to get in the door, it's probably just overall alignment and the fact that product manager roles are relatively limited and in incredibly competitive, but I'm not really sure I'm helping. Um, so come back, let me know if I can be more specific. Okay, so this next one, it looks like we lost one of one. Um, sometimes for whatever reason, uh, StreamYard, the third party platform that I use will lose one of one. So I'm gonna try and figure it out through two of two and three of three, and if not, we can come back. So now HR is considering me for a new location for which a position is yet to open. Also haven't received any interview feedback. HR is scheduled a call tomorrow for 15 minutes. What all should I ask HR other than location visibility? Okay, so I'm gonna have you come back just cause we lost one-on-one. Um, we're only about nine minutes behind on the comments. So um, come back and uh, let's see if we can get one of one in for a little bit more context and, and maybe I can be a little bit more helpful. Um, also, how many interviews should you typically expect for a team match? Is two normal or is there usually more? Uh, team matches are usually one. Um, but sometimes what will happen is there'll be a team match with a hiring manager. If they like you, they sometimes want you to meet with a team member or multiple team members. Two is typically the high end. Sometimes three, maybe they want you to meet with a team member and their skip lead. I've seen that as well. But one is the most common. Two is much less common. And three is very uncommon uh, per team match per team. Uh, but, but on the end side, meeting with a hiring manager and meeting with like another team member is, is relatively common. Okay. So we answered that, um, CE at Google, CE at Google translates to cloud architect. Okay. In, in general. Okay. From a CE at Google. Okay. That's very, very helpful. Thank you for that rebel. Jeff, I was stuck in team match for 10 months, but couldn't find a position. Sadly, recruiter informed me they are closing the position that I originally interviewed for. Will they get back in the future? Yep. Yeah, I mean, look, so this is just kind of the insight that I, I hope is really helpful to share with the community. If you performed really well in the interviews, which you have to perform well to get to team match, you have to be a viable candidate that they would actually consider to hire. So here's what's happened. You've done a fantastic job of passing the interviews. As a recruiter and most recruiters at Google, they're gonna go right into the internal applicant tracking system to find potential new candidates. And they're gonna find you and they're gonna look at your interview feedback and they're gonna give you another chance over an unknown person who applied or got referred in and has no interview feedback. I will pick you 100% of the time. Why? It's data. I have data on you. I have data that shows that you know how to pass the really difficult interviews at Google. You will have another chance. Um, it's just going to be a little bit of a waiting game and just make sure you're keeping your eyes on the jobs boards for like for the same like or similar positions. I hope that helps, but they should absolutely consider you in the future. I've interviewed at Google, Stripe, and so many other places and failed on behavioral rounds. Sometimes it's not too much detail. Sometimes it's the jargons were used. Okay. 
Sometimes the candidates have more closer experience to needs of the role. What am I doing incorrectly? How can I increase my conversions? There is one absolute, we want to put the key in the lock or, you know, I say some silly things. Um, but, but the reality is, is that the one item that will set you apart in your behavioral answers is how. I just don't see it. I do not see candidates and even my clients defining the how. So specifically, if you're working through your actions, you need to tell them what you did. I did X and I did X by doing A, B, and C. Then I did Y and I did Y by doing A, B, and C. If you are not defining what you did, but more importantly, how you did it, that's typically the area where I see most people fall down on the behavioral answers. Then a second piece, the situation is too long. There's too much context. It doesn't matter. The situation and task should be 30 to 40 seconds. You're basically telling them the role in the company and the context should be two to three sentences. So you're just giving a two to three sentences on what's going on and then saying, hey, look, I needed to solve this in three months. Let me tell you what I did. Think about the situation and task at the fifth grade level. We need to make sure that any audience can picture the scenario that we've created. And then the last piece, too many people skip over results. They want to hear the results. Talk about results in terms of answering the question, bring in numbers if applicable and repeatable. What was the bigger win from a process perspective, strategy perspective, relationship perspective, et cetera. I know that's pretty long winded, but those are the items that I look for. I did a video called the perfect behavioral um, interview answer. This was like in the last couple months, few months. Uh, check out that video. It should be really helpful. Um, we're okay. We're at the hour mark, but I'm going to just kind of roll through these last questions and then I'll prompt on my services. And then if questions keep coming in, we'll keep going. Thanks, Jeff. I'll stay optimistic. For the record, your videos helped me so much with interviews and wanted to thank you personally. It prepared me to be considered as an L4 TAM instead of an L3. Amazing. So much of interview prep is you, the community, and the effort and time you're willing to put in. And I just hope that one or two or 20 of the tips that I recommend resonate with you. Uh, but the reality is, is that you're putting in all the work and the effort. And so really, you should be patting yourself on the back to say like, I, I did great work because interviewing is tough. Um, it's something that we rarely practice doing. And, and the more you, the more you put into it, the higher likelihood of success. So I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Jeff, my friend applied to the Google business internship round about, about a month ago. When can she expect to hear back? Um, I would say at a month, if the application's been open for a month, um, she's probably not going to hear back at this point. Uh, they've probably moved on to other candidates is the likely scenario. Um, that's just what I imagine. It's usually, I think they give the guidance if you haven't heard back in like four to six weeks, they've moved on with others. So I would say, Eric, they've probably moved on with others. Drivers for doctorate. All right. Self-satisfaction. Uh, sometimes you speak for a long time and you can't even talk. Uh, drivers for doctorate. Self-satisfaction. First in my family to graduate and attend college. So trying to set a positive example for many of my nieces and nephews. Okay. Um, received a scholarship to attend. Okay. That's good. Professional growth. Although I've learned a lot, I feel like I've stayed in my past company position way too long for being part of the 2% of professionals with, with one. Okay. Apologies for the many typos. Typos are fine. Overall goal is to become a CFO eventually for a startup. Okay. So we're going to have some fun. We're going to go through these items one by one. Self-satisfaction is important. Um, if you feel like this is something you need to do, um, Setting a positive example for your nieces and nephews may not be applicable to their future. These advanced degrees may not exist in five years. It's hard to imagine 
but it's a it's a real possible reality. Um, higher education may be gone in 10 years. OK, so setting an example for them for something that may not exist. It's just an idea that I want to throw out my opinion and challenge just a little bit. OK, but I love setting a positive example in general. Um, received a scholarship. That's baller, right? Like if you don't have to pay for it, that is an absolute game changer. Um, professional growth. Um, I don't know that education uh, delivers that in the sense that you can probably get all that information uh, for free. Not that you're not getting it for free because obviously you're getting a scholarship. Um, so, but it's just that information is all readily available now. Um, so you stayed at your last company in position too long. Okay. Okay. Um, we all are, or many of us who have been in our careers are guilty of that. I definitely did that multiple times in my career. Um, and then being part of the 2% of professionals with one, well, what is your goal, right? Like you have some self-satisfaction. You want to be part of this percent. I mean, I would, I would say, let's go on like a funky path here. A lot of the decisions that I make in my life, I just ask, what would the 70 year old Jeff say? And so ask yourself, what would the 70 year old version of yourself say about being in that 2% and the self-satisfaction? Would they say that these items were worth going after or that it was more important to just double down on building your skill set within another company and that's that's a question i can't answer for you um i think it's we look at higher education now it's just a valuable journey for us to all go through and explore and i can tell you i mean it's that's not part of my future path i i'm not really open to it it's not something that i'm going to consider um, but everybody's personal journey is very, very different. But I think it's just interesting to explore and talk with multiple people about it. But you ultimately need to do what's best for you. And I think that your overall goal uh, to be a CFO for a startup, I mean, it sounds like a good goal. Um, I think that would be fun and you just never know. Right. But I, I think it's a great goal to set for sure. Should behavioral responses aim for impressiveness or focus on how the question is answered? I often worry about not being impressive enough in my answers. Um, I mean, of course you want to impress them because you're only using your examples, your best examples, ideally. You'll have niche down examples where you'll use something that's maybe not as impressive. But what am I looking for? I'm looking for that candidate, my client, to answer the question that I asked them. So I want to hear the answer and I want to know how they impacted those great results, how they did it. Now, how they did it is often going to be in correlation and collaboration with others. But the how is going to be the biggest driver for me. Um, and you just got to hit all the sections, create the visual Tell them what you did and how you did it, and then deliver those fantastic results. Feedback is definitely helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Maybe to add, is there a way I can maximize my time with either my recruiter to find other roles where my skills are transferable with my discussions? I mean, you can continue to ask them for insight. Sometimes recruiters aren't going to be the most valuable. But yeah, I mean, I think just continue to say, what are you liking in my resume? What's going to be the most helpful, etc. Um, that's tough. Sometimes they're just not going to have a big enough lens. But if they've been on the product team, for example, for years, maybe they can give you some good guidance. Just keep, keep pushing. And then and then skills with the Google group PM you're meeting with. Uh, Zachary, I don't, um, that question's throwing me off a little bit. I mean, with the, with the Google group PM, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna ask them about themselves, what they love, what they find exciting, how they've seen people have success. And then of course you can say like, maybe we can take a look at my resume, see how we can tweak it. Um, yeah, it's really going to depend. You can, you can dive in and tell me a little bit more. That might be helpful. Hey, Corey, 
Uh, just topped in, but wanted to say, hey, hope you're doing well. Watched your interview with Eric Twiggs and really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, I think what Eric's going to do is he's going to release a more polished version of our podcast. But I, I had the awesome opportunity to chat with Eric yesterday. We did a, an hour conversation and it was just kind of highlighting how entrepreneurs and employers can hire the best talent. Um, Eric's awesome. He's done 300 podcasts. I mean, he's just I mean, he's just the smoothness of how he does a podcast was really, really impressive. Uh, not quite as hiccupy as as my live sessions. Um, he was pretty, pretty clean and smooth, um, but it was really, really fun to chat with him. I have another really big podcast coming up in a couple of weeks um, and I, it will be on negotiation. Um, that's with somebody who has a really big audience. So I'll be sharing more on my socials about that as well. Trying to get in more podcasts. If anybody ever wants to Refer me over to a podcast or recommend me. Um, always appreciate it. Following up on the doctorate topic, is your opinion on education the same for an MBA? I've always battled if an MBA is necessary for success in business and worth the cash. Apologies for the tangent. Uh, no tangent. Uh, I do not believe an MBA is worth it. This is just my personal opinion. If you've already got your MBA, kudos. That's awesome. But if you're exploring it today at the end of 2023, as we're heading into 2024, I would go develop an AI product, work with a development team, develop something that you're excited about. The chances of the ROI being higher on an AI product than an MBA is through the roof these days. Again, that's just my two cents. Um, people, if they could throw stuff at me, probably would. But um, I just don't believe that master's degrees are worth it today, not a general MBA, especially sometimes roles just require a master's, whether it's nursing or a million other roles, they require it, you need it. But um, just in general, like a generic MBA, I'm not seeing the value in 2023. Do you recommend adding a career break in resume travel or discuss it during the interview of fast? I don't think it's necessary. If it's like, two or three years, then yeah, you probably need to fill something in there. But if it's three months, six months, nine months, I wouldn't put it in there. It just ultimately it ends up being a distraction. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't put it in there. If it's if it's under a year, don't put it in there. I just want to go back to the Zachary. So I know like part of what they do is they set up meetings um, with Googlers for potential Googlers. And so just dive in. Don't be shy to ask tons of questions. Go in with a list of 30 or 40 questions that you think are going to be valuable for you in that conversation. All right. Hour and 12 in. We're out of questions. If more questions come in, I'm going to answer them. But let me just roll into my sum up. And then uh, if more questions come in again, happy to answer them. If this is your first time here, um, or maybe it's not your first time here, my name is Jeff H. Site. My business is practiceinterviews.com. On practiceinterviews.com, I have a ton of free resources. I do one-on-one -on -one interview, one-on-one -on -one negotiation coaching. I have an interview mastery course, and my AI practice interview tool is coming out soon. Um, I've looked at all the competition. I've bought all the competition. The tool is going to provide actionable, real-time feedback and not just throw a blurb of crap at you. It's going to teach you piece by piece how to improve sections of your answer. It's going to be different from anything out there and already playing around with it. I know it's going to have tremendous value. I think that people are going to improve their interview answers in minutes, not hours. And that's going to be the goal of the tool. I'm so excited for it to come out. It is in dev. I have hired a team. It's expensive to do it, but I I know that the viability of it, it's going to be awesome. So I'm so excited. So I chose again. And one of the reasons why you'll hear me talk about this is I chose to put my money into develop, developing AI as opposed to getting an advanced degree. I just think that's the better move today. Of course, sweet. Excited to see more podcasts. Yeah. Um, again, any referrals? I never really asked for that. So I'm asking now um, if you know anybody who has a really great podcast. Um, I'd love to be invited. I always like chatting with people, love chatting with this community. So um, yeah. Can I be a beta tester? Um, anybody who um, I'm going to, I'm going to 
get some sort of sign up list uh, going very, very soon so we can add people in. Uh, the way that I am doing the tool is, is a little bit more lean startup. So uh, I have a lot of ideas of what I think the tool should look like, but the only people that matter are you, the users. And so I'm going to take any and all user feedback into consideration as I continue to develop the benefits, the features of the tool, et cetera. Um, I have a ton of assumptions and I have my hypothesis and, but I need to validate them. And that's going to be a really fun part of the journey for me and the team. Okay, cool. Thanks, Raul. Thank you everybody for this. Um, it would be, uh, I, I got to get that list going for people. So we'll, so we'll get that started ASAP. Thank you for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is where I spent the vast majority of my time, right? Creating the prompts on the back end and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And I'm still tweaking on a daily basis to make sure that that the way I coach and the way I think about things, that these prompts are delivering such incredibly useful feedback that's very specific. And there's a pause moment. And it's like, okay, like let's work on these two things. And ultimately down the line, it's going to get to such a level that we can really niche down and just focus in on the situation and task, just focus in on our frameworks, just focus in on our solutions, our actions, our results, our clarifying questions, and get those items right, right away. So that even if you had an interview tomorrow, you were fixing specific items that you knew were challenge areas for you. Jeff on Joe Rogan when? So this was actually... Um, I wrote down that goal. Uh, I wrote down the goal of being on Joe Rogan. And I think this was probably a few years ago. Um, he's gotten quite a bit bigger. Um, and it's just, it's just a, with Joe Rogan, love him or hate him. Um, his guests are crazy experts in their space. And so a couple things that we'll double down on and, and talk about um, is that it's really valuable to write down goals. And sometimes those goals are going to seem crazy, but what we're training our brain to do is manifest those items. And all the data and studies show that people who write down their goals are the most likely to achieve them. So as we're heading into 2024, write down your professional and personal goals um, for 2024 and whatever else you need to do um, to get aligned. That can be health, family, again, courses, you want to develop an AI tool, you want to make X amount of money, write it down. Um, you will see that that will absolutely change your life. And it's something that I do. And it takes some time. It's not always the easiest process to go through, but it's worthwhile. Hey, Jeff, any YouTube EMEA team insights on potential defreezing new hires? Gut feeling on EMEA trends at G specifically YouTube at UK. Yeah, I mean, me it's been just rough. Yeah, it's just been a rough year for hiring tech in EMEA, especially Google has been absolutely lean. I mean, if I were to look back at my 2022 um, number of clients, you know, from London to Dublin, like to this year, I mean, it's this was basically a part of every weekend of mine. I'd always have somebody um, and, and that could go outside to go to Paris or any of those areas. But it'd be really rare for on a weekend me not to have two or three clients from EMEA. And this year it was crazy low. So I'm optimistic maybe for next year. But yeah, I think this year is uh, might even be a complete wash. Yeah, very rough year in the UK. 100% agree. Be looking out for that sign up. Would love to help if there's any way I can. Thanks, Corey. Jeff, you'd be great on JR. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Okay, we're out of questions. Um, we really didn't have any downtime to talk about why searching for a job sucks, but it's hard, right? And so just make sure that when you are searching for a job, I'm not saying not to apply. It's low hanging fruit, definitely do it, but um, really focus in on your LinkedIn profile, improving your LinkedIn profile, 
networking with a giving first approach that that's going to make the job search suck a little less. And of course, working with our warm network. And as you try to get into these big companies, you know, one of the things you want to think about is like, do I know anybody there? I mean, I remember when I was looking at Google, um, one of my high school classmates that I was friends with and one of my college friends were working at Google and I had no idea. And of course, I tapped into them to get help. So sometimes, especially at these big companies, we may have people we know, former colleagues, former classmates. And so always try to get those warm connections that can be helpful too. Um, when you when I talk about base salary during the salary negotiation, some companies tell me the base salary. What percentage can I raise from the base salary? It really depends. Okay, depends on whether it's a company that's just base salary focused, or there's a base bonus equity. Um, for the bigger companies where equity is a component, the base usually isn't going to move more than five or ten k, fifteen k, maybe. Um, now at the higher levels, maybe it moves 20K or 25K, but usually the base is gonna be the most rigid part. Um, it just depends on the company. If, if base is the only component, it's more movable. If it's one of multiple components, usually it's not gonna move very much. I hope that helps. Holly, Re Holly Lee, buddy of mine, um, recently said that it looks like things are warming up on the Amazon side. Have you seen thawing on freeze recently in the US? Not really. I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm so used to having so many clients for Amazon and I just, it's been really lean this year for Amazon for me personally, but everything was slow. Um, tech just hired at about a fourth of the pace in 2023 that they hired in 2022. And that directly, I directly felt that in my business. Um, Holly and I are friends. We chat. Um, if you are trying to get into Amazon, check out Holly Lee's uh, YouTube channel. It's great. Um, definitely recommend it. She's got lots of great advice. She goes live at 11 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. So if you hop off here and you want to check out her live again, it's just Holly Lee. She'll she'll pop right up on your YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's great to be back. I will be back 10 a.m. Pacific time uh, next Tuesday. If you like what I did today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, uh, consider subscribing. And I will be back next week. And before I go off, I'm just going to answer this last question. Would a role with the Alphabet startup make the transition to Google easier? Maybe, maybe not. But I, I definitely recommend the bets. The bets are really, really fun. So it's something I strongly recommend. Should I ask my recruiter about the freeze in GCP? She mentioned nothing about it last communicated Friday. Yeah. Thomas ask 100%. You should be asking about that and what's going on because uh, she should be sharing that with you. <laughs> Glad you made it in last minute. Have a great week. Corey, thanks for being here. Thank you everybody for being here. If you have any additional questions, practiceinterviews.com. If you don't belong to our Slack group, sign up with our Slack group. If you have any challenges with that Slack sign up, sometimes people do, just email me at jeff at practiceinterviews.com and I'll, I'll get you into the Slack group. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic day. I'll be back next week.